Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Real Visions, The Archives. Today's piece features Joe Duran, and it's from 2018. It's called The Humble Approach to Managing Billions. This wasn't Joe's first time on Real Vision. He had actually been on before. And in that previous interview, he set out a lofty goal of raising United Capital to over $20 billion in assets under management. Well, when Brian Price sat down with him in 2018, he had achieved that goal and beaten it by $4 billion, and United Capital sat at over $24 billion. Since this interview has aired, he's actually been acquired or partnered with Goldman Sachs. So the success has just kept on running for Joe. And if you watch this interview, you're going to see exactly why he has been so incredibly successful in his life. And there's so many lessons that Real Vision viewers can take and apply to things in their life, whether it be business, trading, family, finance, whatever it is, this interview is going to help you to just be better. That's why I picked it. As well, there's some interesting stuff in there about GE, Nike, Bitcoin, that, that really shows how ahead of the curve Joe was. With all that being said, I hope you enjoy this interview with Joe Duran. The one thing that I've evolved to as, as a leader, as a CEO, as a husband and a dad, is that I don't try to change the other person. It's my job to react differently. We do far too little introspection as people. We don't get taught as children that if you can't manage yourself, you can't manage anything around you. That's the real key to this world. We cannot control outcomes. I can't control whether my daughter's coming on time or not. I can't control whether the markets go up or not, or whether when I buy GE, it's gonna go up. Or I have nothing, nothing I can do about outcomes. Whether you win the game or not, you have no say in the matter. What you have say in is your input, that's all. If you want anyone to follow your advice, you have to start by making sure that they feel understood. Hey, it's Brian Price for Real Vision, where today I'll be speaking with Joe Duran, founder and CEO of United Capital. Joe's got $24 billion in assets under management, so his success on Wall Street goes without saying. However, I think you're going to be really fascinated to hear about his psychological approach to investing, which has driven his growth over the years. Joe, thank you so much for joining us again on Real Vision. It's great to be here. Pleasure to have you with us. And in this year and a half, folks keep writing in, when's Joe coming back? When's uh -huh. Joe coming back? You're back, and we have so much to talk about uh, since you joined us last. And I want to start off by asking you about the changing role of the CEO. Well, uh, there's the general role of the CEO, and there's the way it's evolved for me as an individual, starting from a startup to running a company with now almost 700 employees. I'd say the, the role in general has evolved into one in which you have to stand for something. Um, whether people like it or not, brands today have come to represent the joint collective opinions of the people who work there. And this is something relatively new. You know, when I started in business 20 some years ago, it was very important that companies had no opinion, that they simply were as amorphous and unopinionated as humanly possible because you didn't want to offend anybody. What's definitely changed in the last two decades is that companies need to stand for something. Customers want to shop with firms that represent their values. And so when you see firms that are conscious capitalists like Starbucks or Lululemon or Whole Foods, now part of Amazon, they all have an opinion about the world. Employees who work there are drawn to that lighthouse opinion and customers either align or don't align with the opinion of that brand. It's for, whether it's a firm like Chick-fil-A that has a very southern view of the world, or a firm like uh, Starbucks that has a very northwestern view of the world, there's clearly an opinion that's expected. And the reason that matters so much is that brand is a much more important thing in this world now that the world is getting smaller. And brand really represents what you stand for. It's not the name doesn't matter, the col colors don't matter. What really has come to form brand is what do you stand for and what can I expect when I shop with you, buy from you, or experience one of your employees? How do I think you'll treat me when there's a mistake? How do I think you'll treat me when, when I want to return something? And all of those things form the pillars of brand. And the CEO in particular has to be the shining example of what that means. And so the standards are much higher because unlike the past where it was really about driving results, making sure that you got the revenue growth and the profitability that you expected, 
It's now about also being the ambassador for the brand, standing up for what's right and wrong, and sometimes making long-term decisions that are commercially short-term not, not good for you. In other words, knowing that if something happens that compromises the long-term value of the brand, you need to do something that might in the short term be painful. And those are things that are really a new way of doing business. And we're seeing that whether it's Apple or any of the other major brands, Nike. Nike, Nike is a great example, right? And uh, you see it everywhere now. When we think of the leading brands, you know what they stand for. Expand a little bit on your observations when it came to Nike and what we've seen with them and their role with uh, Colin Kaepernick in these last couple of weeks. Well, again, I, I don't want to tread into politics, but just as an observer of business, they clearly did it to catch eyeballs. So there's the commercial aspect of getting somebody who creates a lot of buzz and do something interesting with them. Uh, they knew, I think, in two ways. One, that you can go with somebody that can create a lot of, of opinions on both sides and deliver a message that is hard to argue with. And that's what they did. If you actually watched the commercial, I don't think there are many people, regardless of who's delivering it, that wouldn't agree with the underlying sentiment. The character who's delivering the message is polarizing and captures everyone's eyeballs. What Nike knew is that everyone who's got opinions, once they actually watch the message, they're going to have trouble arguing with it. So I thought it was a brilliant, a typical of Nike, a brilliant move to capture attention and then deliver a message that they really believe in, which is that, hey, we're all the same, uh, and you've got to have courage to stand up what you believe in, whatever that is, no matter whether it's going to alienate people or not, that you need to be true to yourself. And that's a great brand message for them to send out. Joe, you have a unique understanding of GE having sold a company to GE. I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit on what's happening with the name currently. We uh, sold our first firm to General Electric uh, 14 years ago now, and uh, the company was worth at the time around $600 billion, which uh, is amazing when you think now, 14 years later, something like that, it's now down to around $100 billion, so lost half a trillion dollars in value. And it was at the time the poster boy of the great American company. Jack Welch was running it. I became president of GE Private Asset Management. And it's really become a victim of its own success because what happened was that all the things that had led it to be successful, they then viewed as sacred cows that were never to be challenged. Uh, every division at GE was run by the CFO. The CFO would tell each division what their earnings were going to be in the coming year. They became masters of financial engineering. They were determined on being the number one or number two in every area that they were. And that led them to not go into areas where they should have gone and explored, but wouldn't because they had to be dominant in that market in order to participate. And it led them also to not be innovative because what happened is many of the things that happened at Kodak or any of the other great brands, if you become too dogmatic about this is how we do things and do not ever challenge them, you become too determined that your mission statement and your vision statement are never to change. You become stubborn and when the business world evolves, you cannot compete with it. Uh, and so when I, as part of GE, saw this incredibly rigid view of the world I'm not surprised to see where they are now. This lack of adaptability, and you've seen it in retail all over the world, where Walmart has adapted and realized it has to be like Amazon. But firms like JCPenney and Sears did not. That if you don't adapt, you'll die. That the core business message that GE has for everybody is, you have no sacred cows. Other than being into having integrity and doing the right thing for consumers, the way that happens has to be adaptable. And the great companies of today, whether it's Amazon or Facebook or Google, they understand that they are nothing if not adaptable. They have very broad mission statements. Google's is, we inform the world. That allows them to do almost anything. In Netflix, we entertain the world. It allows them to do anything. And they think and adapt they have no sacred cars. Netflix wasn't just a company that sent DVDs to people. Its view was, we entertain however that needs to be. And we have to think differently as business people too. And GE needs to think differently about what its business is. 
I would tell you the other thing I think that they made a massive mistake in. GE was an incredible household name. There were few homes in the country. I remember at one time when I first worked with them, they said there's not one family in America that does not have a GE product, whether it's a light bulb or a fridge or a microwave or a telephone. That's not true today. My kids don't even know what GE is. That brand is not worth what it used to be. It now makes power plants that nobody cares about. It owns oil distribution that nobody cares about. There's a lot of power to having a retail brand, and GE threw its retail brand away with no regard, which is amazing. A retail brand that the world would have died for, and they just shipped it away. They didn't realize the power of having that light bulb in every home with General Electric and the logo on it every morning, and the fridge that sat there with the logo on. There's a lot of power to brand, and they just chose to throw it away. Can they get it back? I don't think you do get it back. Once you're yesterday's news, it's very hard to resuscitate a brand. And how do they go back to being in every single household? How do you go back to that? You know, Coca-Cola always understood that we're the world's soft drink company, and they knew the power of having anywhere in the world. It was hard to drive five miles without a Coca-Cola something somewhere. It allowed them to do almost anything. GE used to have that. And it's amazing that they didn't realize they basically had a post-it note, a, a billboard in every house in America and chose to say, no, let's get rid of that. One of the things you've lived your life by is this saying, what if I'm wrong? Yeah. And this really all relates back to that, this idea that you've got to get up every morning and ask yourself, as, as, as much conviction as I have, what if I'm incorrect about this? Yeah. How do you relay that message to a younger generation of investors who maybe lack the humility that you have despite your tremendous success? You know, it's interesting. Uh, humility is uh, something I, I study a lot of philosophy and I read a lot. And uh, humility is, we all have it, you know. It's just whether we display it or not. Um, we're in an environment where, for many people, you look weak if you are vulnerable. And I've, in fact, found it to be the exact opposite, that, that authenticity far, far trumps strength. That authenticity and truly understanding yourself is incredibly compelling to anyone. And being honest about who you are, even if what that is is not that appealing to people. You look at our president as an example. Regardless of your opinion of him, he's the real deal. And that draws a lot of people who see that I might not like some of what I see, but I appreciate that it's authentic. Very few people understand the reason our politicians are in general so unpopular is how little authenticity there is. They might all say the right thing, but nobody believes that they believe it. And so that is the one truth that I have found for myself. And questioning yourself, the humility you have, that person that you are at three in the morning when you wake up with sweaty palms, or when you're tossing and turning about something your spouse said or something financial that's concerning you, that person is also a part of your waking life. We can pretend they don't exist, all the insecurities and doubts and questions, the doubts about whether I'm hiring the right person or whether we're going to make payroll, or all the things that happen when you're building a company or making investment decisions. But that person needs to be stared at. Because that person, if you don't come to comfort with who you are when you're weak and the things that you're afraid of, those are the, those are the demons that are going to come and eat your life. They are what's going to cause you to have a failed marriage. They're going to what causes you to make bad financial decisions or make you be a bad CEO. Which is why that question of what if I'm wrong is a question you always have to ask yourself. Because if you don't know your weaknesses, if you don't know where, where the worst part of you comes out, the world will ensure that you get to places where that person is going to come out and bring out the very worst in you. And so I, I think while it's great to work on your strengths, and there are certain things I'm not going to change about myself. I'm really disorganized. That's probably not getting better tomorrow. Now, I also know if somebody disrespects me, or I'm surprised that that brings out the worst of me. And I, we call it the gladiator of my office. Um, and I think this is important, I think, for a lot of people. Because rather than talk about this idea of your weakness, I'll just share with you mine. 
there are two things you need to do when you're assessing your own weaknesses. The first is to find out how that weakness is transported. How does it display itself? For me, it's anger. So when I'm angry, when I'm short or abrupt, dismissive, and I feel frustrated, I've been triggered. I then have to ask myself only one of two questions. Am I feeling like I'm being disrespected or am I being surprised? In other words, did I have expectations that didn't come to pass? Those are my two triggers. Uh, and invariably, the person is not disrespecting me. I just feel like something has happened in my life that causes whatever this person's saying it and however they're saying it to actually make me feel disrespected. Or somebody did something that I didn't expect. Again, just the way the world is, I just had mis misinterpreted and, and misunderstood what I thought they would do. Once you understand what the heck your triggers are, you're able to then stare at them and say, is this true? And almost always that instinct, if you don't have control of it, your instincts are going to give you the wrong information. And I'll use a simple example, my 17-year-old daughter. Um, I might say to her, are we going to see you at dinner tonight? She says, yes. And then I'll say, make sure you're there by 6.30, I'm making steaks, or whatever it is I'm making. And now it's quarter to seven, and I'm texting her, she's not calling me back, and I just feel like my frustration's brewing. I'm using a simple example. This could be a work situation or anything else, right? Then she walks through the door, and if I haven't asked myself, why am I angry here? Do I think my daughter's actually disrespecting me? No, she's just not even thinking of me. She was busy thinking about her friends, or she was held late at practice, she didn't have a phone volume on, whatever it is. There might be a thousand reasons that I have to be frustrated, but one of them is not being disrespected, because she will come in, and how do I make the situation better by yelling at her? I don't. I'm actually making it far worse. So I think the one thing that I've evolved to as, as a leader, as a CEO, as a husband and a dad, is that I don't try to change the other person. It's my job to react differently. Because if she comes in and I'm annoyed and I'm frustrated and we get into a screaming match, I'm accomplishing absolutely nothing. If I don't want this to happen again, she needs to understand why it really matters to me. And that's not gonna happen by me yelling and saying, you're disrespecting me, the steak is cold, I bought really good steak for you because I thought you loved it and you do this to me. That's not her intention. She's a lovely daughter, she loves me. I have to have different expectations. I should know, my, she's never answers her cell phone. It, not now and not ever, you know? She's a teenager, I gotta text her. Uh, I should not expect her to show up on time. She never shows up on time. So I have irrational expectations and it's not her problem, it's my problem. Now, if I wanted to help her become more polite and learn how to have more manners and be more considerate, that's not the time to do it. So realizing that your life and how you act and what you do frames 100% of your relationships, for me, is really important. What you've just described, for many, is a lifelong pursuit. Mm. This understanding of self, this understanding of what triggers me and what, in turn, is the best way to respond yeah. in a trying situation. So for those watching out there, perhaps in awe, myself included, how would you say you gain this understanding of who you are as a person? It's only one way. You have to ask yourself constantly, who am I? Um, and the challenge is that we often answer that question with a label. I'm a dad. I'm a successful business person. I'm an author. I'm an interviewer. But you're none of those things. And when you peel the layer, you're not going to get to a thing. What you're going to get to is a set of feelings and intentions that you have as a being. We do far too little introspection as people. We don't get taught as children that if you can't manage yourself, you can't manage anything around you. That's the real key to this world. Uh, and the advice that we're constantly doing with our clients and with our advisors and our employees, look, don't blame anything for anything. It's you. And the most important thing as a human you can ask yourself is do you think the world, when things happen, they're happening to you or they're happening for you? I know it's a very simple question, just the change from two to four. But if you believe things are happening for you, my frustration, the example I gave with my daughter, 
It's to teach me something, and maybe to teach her something. She's not doing it to me. She happens to be showing up late, and I can use that opportunity to say, what can I do differently so that this doesn't happen? It's just so much easier to blame the world for where you're at. It's so much easier to blame my daughter for my anger, or my wife, or my situation, or what's happening with the markets. It's so much easier to say, I am a victim of whatever happens to me. But if you actually say, no, everything's happening to you for a purpose, and until you get the lesson, it's going to keep on happening. You're going to keep on chasing the wrong person, or making the wrong financial decision, or buying stocks at the exact worst time, until you have learned, this is happening for me until I learn. If you actually take that lens on everything, you're going to have a lot less concern about the outcome and a lot more respect for the process. And we try to train this all the time. We cannot control outcomes. I can't control whether my daughter's coming on time or not. I can't control whether the markets go up or not, or whether when I buy GE it's going to go up. Or go. I have nothing, nothing I can do about outcomes. Whether you win the game or not, you have no say in the matter. What you have say in is your input. That's all. And so, again, we too seldom think about our process, our intention, our effort. That's all that really matters. How am I going to do it? Am I doing it for the right reasons? And if that is true, and I'm giving everything I got, it doesn't matter what the outcome is. Because if you do that, regardless of the outcome, you're going to be proud of your actions. And honestly, taking pride in how and why and the level at which you do things, that's all you can control. The challenge is, of course, that we're all going for the shiny object. We all think when we get the shiny object, we'll be happy. But we won't. The shiny object will be replaced by two shiny objects, or a larger shiny object, or the shiny object our friends tell us we should have. And this fear of missing out and doing and desiring what everyone else wants, you know, well, your kid went to such and such a school, now my kid needs to go to such and such a school, or your kid is so gifted or an athlete, my kid should be a gifted athlete. It doesn't matter. You know, people's success or failure has nothing to do with you. And yet, we live in a world where we are all consumed by everybody's business. And yet, nobody really cares about your business. You do. Nobody really cares about your success. You do. Maybe there's a few people who love you who genuinely care. And so again, I think for me it's very simple. What is your intention? What really matters to you? What makes you feel good as a person, really, in your belly feel good? And it's not going to be money, and it's not going to be a private plane. It won't be those things. It might be the things that come with it. But, uh, but what I have found, and I found this no matter how wealthy you are, we have very wealthy clients, we have clients who have very little, there's very little correlation between wealth and happiness. There's very little correlation between being loved and, and having more money. Being somebody who people are drawn to, enjoy being with, and being more wealthy. So I just think, again, there's too little asking of ourselves. And there's so little inspiration in the world to say, you know, learn about yourself more. You know, and, and with all of the social media, it's just more and more about Look at me, look at this, take this, this is what you want, this is what you should have. And consciousness and making conscious decisions really should be the only thing that matters in your life. Well, you are very successful and very wealthy. I'm just putting that out there. Uh -huh. But you're very happy. Yeah. And you're saying there's less of a correlation between wealth and happiness. Well, so uh, what's been your let me, secret? Let me, let, me, let me adjust that for you. Sure. Um, I don't know that happy is the word I'd describe to be where I'm at. I'll tell you interestingly enough, it, um, happiness is a very interesting idea. And I'm not sure that it's a quest I care that much about. Happiness implies an opinion about what's good and bad, and like and not like. And um, I'll, I'll give you an inter interesting example. It drives my wife crazy. You know, we, we just had our 25th anniversary, we're about to have our 26th. And she says, Joe, you're never satisfied. And implied in happiness is that you're satisfied. And she's absolutely right. There's no accomplishment I've ever had that I actually feel is done, ever. I mean, I make one exception. My kids make me feel truly satisfied. But other than that, I'm constantly, there's more, there's more. I've got to do one more. 
and she says, are you ever happy? And if you ask my wife, she'll say, he's unbelievably driven, and he is proud of what he does and how he does it. And I am, I am really, I can't do more than I, than I do. I couldn't care more than I care. And I know my intentions, whether they get translated right or not, are always good. But happiness, to me, is an illusion. It's not something I can tell you I feel. I feel immense gratitude. I feel immense accomplishment at times. But I never feel like it's done. I never feel like I'm sated. I have a constant burning anxiety in my stomach that I meditate every morning and see it and I go, hi, anxiety. It's nice to see you. There or I wake up at 3 My old morning, friend, there you are and again. there it is, just sitting there, burning, 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 saying, you've got to have more, you've got to do more, you didn't do enough, you treated this person poorly, you did th this person badly, and reminding me of all the ways in which I didn't do what I could have done. Uh, and no one sees that like my wife. You know, who every morning she has a wall of pillows that she has to put up because I'll be meditating or reading or questioning myself or writing in a journal. Um, so happiness, in and of itself, it's great if you can die happy. I think it's more important to die having known that you've given everything you've got, that you have done everything with the tools that were given to you that were humanly possible. At least for me, that's my standard that I feel like I woke up every day and did the right thing and gave everything I had, that I didn't take advantage of people, that, that no one ever questioned my intentions. And we are naturally people that are selfish. So hopefully I didn't put myself ahead of anyone else. Even though as an instinct, it's our natural act to say, what do I get out of this thing? And realizing constantly what you get most is when you give most, that when you actually have the right intention of serving someone. My real intention, to go back to that example with my daughter, if my real intention is to serve her a great meal, shouldn't I do it in a way that makes her happy? Like, should I really care if she's 15 minutes late and the steak's a little colder? If my real loving intention was for her to have a great meal with me, why would I go ruin it? And it's not her ruining it. Yes, she came late. Yes, she, for whatever reason, didn't show up on time, didn't tell me. But I am the one ruining it, not her. I am choosing to make it a lot worse than it could be. And if my real intention was to give her a great meal, she comes and I say, I'm sorry it's a little colder than it needed to be, but let's have a great meal. Tell me about your day. And it's hard. It's hard when you feel wrong done by. It's hard when your pride gets in the way to do the right thing. And you lose and end up hurting yourself. Not You hurt the other person too, but you hurt yourself more. How do you take these concepts and these ideas which have driven your approach to life, your approach to your family, and overlay them with behavioral economics? Because I know yeah. that's a key study for you yeah. in your business. How do you apply your day-to-day -day grind, your day-to-day -day interactions with that understanding of how markets behave and work and how yeah. you interact? So the first is uh, to have awareness. Um, and so we use behavioral economics to, to help us learn if a person is driven by fear or a need to protect, a need to enjoy life and make the most of it, or a need to give. That lens affects very much what you think money's primary purpose is. And so if you are driven, as I am, by fear and a need to protect, money for me is a way to get peace of mind. Now, interestingly enough, every study we've done, no matter how much money you have, I'm, you're never going to get that peace of mind. The mistake will be that you think that I'm just going to get a little bit more, a little bit more, and the more you get, the more you go, well, it's still not there, I still don't feel good, because it had nothing to do with the money, of course. Money is nothing more than fuel. It's just a resource that allows you to have choices. We very often use it as an end state. That's like saying, I want to retire at a gas station. It's just a resource, you know. If you are driven by pleasure, then you use money constantly to satisfy and give your, make yourself feel good. And then as soon as you spend it, you go, okay, I, I don't feel that good anymore. I need to go buy something else. And if you're driven by giving, then you use money to really share your love with people, even though what they might want is for you to be happier and for you to take care of yourself. 
Uh, and so that lens, just being conscious of it, helps us to inform you about, look, you've got to have all three. You know, happiness in this world requires that you, that you take care of the people around you and that you do protect yourself and that you do enjoy life. And you don't want to be overweight in anyone. So the first is have awareness. By the way, it's a great book on the subject, if you ever wanted to read it, called Awareness by a gentleman called Anthony DeMello. He was a Jesuit priest and a Buddhist monk. Uh, and the book Awareness is really good about giving you consciousness. But what we do is we use science to determine how you think about it. The second is you have to understand your intentions. Uh, interestingly enough, today, if you go to a financial planner, they're going to spend a lot of time on your goals. You're going to spend a lot of time on your investing. But the truth is they have no idea what the markets are going to do. I don't care how smart they are. I have never met a single human being who knows what the market's going to do tomorrow. Uh, and if that's true, and I've spent decades and billions of dollars that I've overseen, I'd like to find the person that knows what the market's going to do tomorrow. And I'm on TV every week or two talking about the markets. I don't pretend to know. I have a guess. And maybe it's a little more educated than some, but it doesn't necessarily mean I know any more than anything, anyone else. But intentions really matter. And so when you go to a wealth manager and they're talking about goals and your plan, and they know that every plan that's ever been written is wrong the day it's written, because it assumes that you're average and you're going to have an average life, but no human has ever lived anything but a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Then you ask yourself, is there anything permanent about a financial plan? And there is one thing that is permanent, your intentions. Why do you work? So we start by understanding your biases. The second thing we want to do is understand your intentions. What is the purpose of your working? Why are you doing it? What is the purpose of your money? And it matters a lot, not just for you, but if you're in a relationship so that you're on the same page. Because it is remarkable how often a couple will be married for a decade and they will have completely different views about what money is for and why they work. Completely different views. And therefore, every conflict and every decision that ever happens in that house for example, going on vacation. One views money that it's there to enjoy and wants to take the greatest vacation they can. The person who views it like it's there to protect and that money's primary goal is to ensure that everyone's okay if anything happens to me, every dollar spent on a vacation, you're compromising what really matters to me. But no one's ever talked about what is this money for? And it might be to spend time with people I care about or it might be to make sure I'm not a burden to my family ever or to make sure they're okay if I'm not around, or to educate the people I care about, to actually articulate and put into words what your intentions are around the money, because that probably won't change. Your goals will change. As you get wealthier, after you have kids, if your spouse gets cancer, your goals change. What doesn't change is the motivation and the intention. So for us, we start with your biases, we then learn what your intentions are, and then we track and measure that you're doing the things every day, often not financial in nature, that actually ensure that you're gonna be happy or do the things that make you feel satisfied. Um, and so again, that's the view for us. Behavioral economics allows us to articulate clearly the reason we're alive. What a life lived richly really means to us. So it's not just vague ideas or, oh, you know, I kind of think I really like to do this. Actually articulating what matters to you, putting it in writing, ensuring it's documented, and then measuring and tracking that we do what matters to you and making sure that both husband and wife have spoken about what really matters so that it's clearly understood this is something I really care about and you care about, we care about it. This is our number one reason for working. And by the way, just so you know, across our 20-some thousand clients, the number one reason that people work is to spend time with, with people they care about. And ironically, even though that's true of our 20-some thousand, 100,000 clients that we're humans that we're actually serving, we're a nation that doesn't take vacations. We're a nation that works too long, that doesn't go watch our kids' events, that doesn't come home to cook dinner, that doesn't go on date night with the person we love, that we're all working so hard to make more and more money so we can keep up with everybody. And now, while our kids are young and we can be with them, we're not doing it because we're so busy confused about what it is we're really here to do. And so what we're often doing is just giving people consciousness about their choices. So we say, look, if your number one th thing is to spend time with people you care about, make sure you have date night. Make sure you're there to support your kids. Tuck them into bed. 
because they're only going to want you to do that for a certain period of time. And if you don't do it now, they won't want to be with you when they're in their 20s. So again, a lot of it is just bringing consciousness to the decision making. So all the philosophy and the psychology that I study is really about how do we bring science into the conscious choices that people make every day. So it's not just some highfalutin West Coast thing, but real science that helps people make better decisions every day. What I'm hearing from you is that the key to the successful relationship between an advisor and a client or an advisor and a family, just like what you say, it isn't about looking at charts and graphs and trying to time the market, but you're a counselor at the end of the day. It's, it's understanding. Uh, here, here's the one truth that uh, I can't remember the name of the, of the psychologist who said this. If you want anyone to follow your advice, you have to start by making sure that they feel understood. So, if that's true, and there is countless work to, to support and validate that, then you must seek to understand first. Understand yourself and understand the other person. And if you don't, any advice you give will fall on deaf ears. The truth is, if I tell you this is what I think you should do, but you don't think I know what you're thinking and feeling, you're not going to respect or listen. You might say, oh, he's a very smart guy and he's got good ideas. Or resonate. But you won't know how they apply to you. If I've actually taken the time to really, really understand you, you might disagree with my advice, but you will know that it is tailored to you. And so ultimately, in this world of robos and technology and everything else, the rise of the human will be built around understanding. It is the core, the empathy, the connectivity that makes humans unique is our ability to know when yes means yes, and when it means maybe, and when it means no. Knowing by reading and seeing and understanding what somebody is really about. And that for me is the core of a great relationship. That don't give advice until you understand. And understanding means getting your own opinions out of the mix. You can have opinions after, but first, remove all your opinions and just listen. Given your psychological approach, to investing, and you, you just moments ago touched on this, what do you see for robo-advisors and the idea of passive versus active and these approaches and these methods that are removing the human element from investing? I think what you're seeing actually with everyone now is it's very easy when the stakes are low to do everything yourself. So, you know, if I stub my toe or I get a thorn or I get something weird, it's easy to go to online look at a medical site and say, this is what you should do. If I have a, I, my heart starts to palpitate and I'm losing breath and getting dizzy, I'm not going, I might look at a website, but I'm going to a doctor. Same thing with legal, you know, when I'm starting a new company and I have no employees and everything else, I can go to LegalZoom and do a perfectly good job setting it up. Once I actually have a few employees and the stakes are higher, I'm going to go get a lawyer. Our industry is no different. When the stakes are low and the complexity is low, you can use technology to make your own decision. However, in all advice businesses, medical, accounting, lawyers, and financial advising, when the stakes are high, when the complexity goes up, you need a human being because technology still doesn't allow for us to have empathy and connectivity. And most importantly, you want somebody to, to, to point out when you're wrong. Walk you through Well, it. a computer can't do that, right? A computer can't tell you this is a mistake. Or you're saying yes, you really feel no, and says, you know, you're not thinking about this other thing. Computers can only do what they're programmed to do. And there are many instances where you're going to be the outlier. We've all been there where you're not in the middle of the lane and you're calling and I've got something that's not programmed in this phone line and you're frustrated because you just want to call a human being who can take you right to the answer. Imagine if your whole financial well-being is linked to a machine that doesn't have the ability to say, hold on a minute, you're in a unique circumstance. That's why we need doctors. Now, for 80 or 90% of the circumstances, there might be a canned answer. The problem is that 5 or 10% could be the one that kills you. And we are human beings don't want to trust. We need someone to blame if things go wrong, but more importantly, we need somebody to point out something if we're not seeing it or we're not thinking about it. Does that thinking apply to autonomous driving? Are you comfortable in a car that might be driven by a machine or going in and being operated it on by a machine? It depends if there's humans on the road. If there are no humans on the road, I'd be completely comfortable. Uh, I think, and, and I, I think this is where we'll probably end up, by the way. 
we always seem to think as humans of, of binary outcomes. Do you believe in computers or do you believe in humans? Well, the truth is it's going to be something, it'll be and. It'll be and. It's not or, it's and. And autonomous driving, what will probably end up happening is there will be one lane of autonomous vehicles that will be boogieing like nobody's business and be efficient and on time with half a meter between cars. And then there will be the human lanes that will be cluttered with people not pulling over, flipping each other the bird and being rude. And ultimately then the lanes will expand and they'll be more autonomous and more autonomous. As long as they are human beings on the road, there has to be a way to adjust or these things will just shut down and stop moving. But yeah, I have complete faith because candidly, as long as I'm in a city, I'm not going to have a problem. So the unpredictability, that's the challenge that you have with any computer. As far as growth, uh -huh. we've talked a lot about your investment approach, the idea of having blinders on and staying focused on your lane. Yeah. You've grown your company tremendously. Yeah. Uh, when you spoke with Real Vision about a year and a half ago, you said, hey, look, I want to get to a checkpoint of about 20 billion in yeah. assets under management. Yeah. You're 24 right now, uh -huh. so you've far exceeded that. Yeah. What has been the key driver of that growth for you beyond your philosophy? Is there any one catalyst that you can yeah. trace back to? We go through an exercise every 18 months. I don't know if I mentioned this last go around, where we say, how do we beat United Capital? How do we beat our firm? And uh, a couple years ago, the answer to that was that we're not, if we want to beat this firm, the way we would beat United Capital is to offer the tools and systems we have without owning the underlying firms that offer it. And so that was the very beginning of saying, how would we do that? And by the way, your best ideas are not going to come from thinking about how you do what you do better. It's thinking about how you would beat yourself. Uh, and when you do that, you write down, and our idea was, hey, if we could offer our systems and our technology to the right kind of advisors, we could be growing at double or triple our rate. And in fact, that business alone, it took us, uh, let's see, 13 years to get to 23, 24 billion. In 18 months, we got to te over 10 billion in signed contracts, in addition, so in the top of the 24 billion. Uh, that business will probably double in size every 12 to 18 months for as far as the eye can see. Uh, so we think that business will be a $100 billion business in the next five to seven years. And our core business will continue to grow, but that business is exponential growth. Exponential growth. And, and it's simply by saying the sacred cow we had that we must distribute and own the entire client experience Asking ourselves, is that holding us back and what would we do differently if we were starting today is what led to this idea that it's going to allow us to be exponential growers. And again, that's we started early on with a sacred cow idea. You must be willing to break your sacred cows. Again, not questioning your integrity or your values, but certainly your visions and certainly your view about what, how things are going to transpire, your mission statement. To question yourself and say, how is it a limiting factor on stopping me from being even more successful. So clearly that exponential growth, the potential for that growth is tremendously exciting. Yeah. But I also want to ask in general, as far as what you're seeing in the world today, what are you most excited about? I mean, without a doubt, it's machine learning. And we often confuse artificial intelligence with, with uh, machine learning. Very much like we think about Bitcoin and blockchain. Bitcoin was the bright, shiny object everybody was excited by when the real power was the blockchain, the technology that allowed you to do all of these transactions and ledger them. The same is true about artificial intelligence. We might be a very long way away from sentient beings where they think for themselves, but the technology that's powering it, the machine learning, the ability to take data and adapt the programming based on new information, that's unbelievably exciting and it's going to change the world. It is changing the world. You know, self-driving cars are powered by, by machine learning. Uh, when you go online and you do shopping and you get customized ads or you get analytics to tell you what's the next word you're typing on your phone, all of that is machine learning. It makes the world a lot, lot easier to navigate and, and the way it's going to be used by financial service firms is going to change the world. If I'm hearing you correctly as we close here, it sounds like you're saying that we are essentially on the cusp of what will become the most efficient human advisor and client relationship we've ever seen. Ever, and also the most exciting. 
is we're going to get to talk about what really matters. That if you're not talking about what really matters, you're going to be in the dust, dust pan of history. That what, if you're not talking about things that really concern people, and that's not investing, and that's not, that's not their financial plan, that you're not going to be relevant at all. But if you do, you're going to be talking about the things that really matter. You're going to be making huge impact on people. So for us, it's an incredibly exciting time. Um, and of course, the hardest thing is to change. You know, for most advisors, they're very accustomed to what they're doing. They don't want to change. And it's unfortunate because there's such a massive first mover advantage. The sooner you do it, the more competitive advantage you have, the more clients you're going to get, the more exciting people, excited people are going to be to work with you. So it's an amazing time. The good news for us is we see so few competitors thinking about the human element and life and living richly rather than dying rich. So it's uh, an incredibly exciting time. What do you see as the biggest red flag in markets right now? We've talked a lot about growth and positivity. What keeps you up at night? Well, without a doubt, it is the un unbelievable amounts of, of debt that our governments around the world have taken. Uh, we have now far more debt than we did in 2007. And it's all supported by the tax authority of all of these governments. Now, the challenge is that their balance sheets allow them to borrow a heck of a lot more. And unfortunately, what I'm seeing in all of the Western world is this willingness to take multiples of GDP way beyond anything we've ever experienced. You know, we sneeze at trillion dollar deficits. It took us hundreds of years to get to a trillion dollar deficit. We're at 15 trillion now, and we're happy to keep adding a trillion every year as if it doesn't matter. Ultimately, unfortunately, the more that you borrow, the less flexibility you have. And we're not doing anything to address our long-term serious liabilities as a country, Social Security, Medicaid, et cetera. What I worry about most is the lack of flexibility if the economy did stall out. Because how much more can governments borrow? And that's happened worldwide. And there doesn't seem to be anyone willing to step back from the table and say, enough. Uh, so I hope we don't all end up like Greece. That's my biggest concern is uh, the level of debt and the incredibly low rates at which it's being offered that doesn't provide the kind of protection that debt used to provide when it was delivering a seven, eight, nine percent yield. Is there anything I haven't asked you about? We've covered a lot. Yeah. But is there anything I haven't asked you about that you want to make sure you mention as we close? I think um, if there's one takeaway from all of this, I hope that people sense this underlying optimism that I have that, that whatever frustrations people have can be cured immediately by just understanding that it's you, that you are ultimately completely responsible for how you're feeling, how the world treats you, and what it gives you every day. Uh, and while I might sound like I have it all together, intellectually I, I might, but in a personal sense, it is a fight every day that, to get comfortable with the fact that we are all meant to suffer, and suffering is part of living. And that the thing that I try to beat every day is the idea that suffering is bad. That in fact, good and bad, that is just an opinion. And that uh, it's an amazing world, that amazing things can happen if you're just open to them. Well, what a fascinating look inside the mind of one of Wall Street's most successful investors. Uh, for me, maneuvering the 24-hour news cycle and the volume and the chest thumping, it's just really refreshing to hear from somebody like Joe, who's willing to be open and honest and candid when it comes to their psychological approach to both being an investor and being a father. And I hope you took as much away from it as I did. For Real Vision, I'm Brian Price.